sloping. I love it. All right, let's get started. All right, a uh, lot to talk about. Let's, let's get right into it. So again, thanks for, for DG Drop Tables holding it down. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> How are you? Uh, pretty good. Yeah. Are you still having that police problems or everything okay? Uh, it's getting better. Yeah. It's getting better. Do you need a good lawyer in town? Because I have one. Yeah, my, you me the contact info? What's that? Yeah, so my, one of my PhD students got in trouble for like, like whatever, minor <laughs> So we have somebody we can help you out, okay? They wrote <laughs> No, they're not wrote <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, all right, so let's, let's talk about uh, databases. So real quickly, um, the, the, we have a talk today uh, in Gates May 4 at 4.30 p.m. Uh, so this is uh, one of the head engineers from Vertica is coming to give a talk. So Vertica, believe it or not, has a small development branch here in, in Pittsburgh. And so Steve is going to come and talk about some of the things that they've been working on. Vertica is a disk-based distributed column store database. It has a bunch of words we've been throwing around throughout the entire semester, but it means it runs multiple nodes, it's a column store, and, and it assumes the primary storage location of the database is on disk. So this is one of the, the it's not the, it's one of the first column stores that came out in the mid-2000s that uh, sort of, that began the wave of column store databases. So column store databases aren't really that rare now. Um, but back in the, back when Verga came out in two thousand six ish, that was considered a uh, that was considered a major techno te technological breakthrough. So so Stephen's a good guy. Um, if you want to go, he'll, he'll talk about the kind of things that they're working on. And for that one, that'll be fruit there, not pizza. Um, so again, plan accordingly. All right. So today uh, we want to continue our discussion on talking about tree indexes. So I want to spend a little bit of time in the beginning. Uh, doing some demos and discussing more about B plus trees to finish up the things that we we left out last class, and then we'll talk about different ways. Uh, we'll talk about more ways you can use indexes beyond the you know straight key mapped into a data structure that we've been talking about so far, and then we'll talk about an alternative to B plus trees, uh, tries or radix trees, and we'll get, again we'll go through what, what makes these unique, what makes them different, and how are they better or worse than B plus trees. And then we'll finish up really quickly with a sort of a brain dump of inverted indexes. I'm not going to teach you how they work. Uh, we have courses here at CMU that can do that. This is just so you know that these things actually exist. So when you go out in the real world and, and you realize that the thing you want to index can't be indexed in a B plus tree, you want to use one of these inverted indexes. All right, so the, the last class, we had a couple questions about how are we actually going to handle duplicate keys in our B plus tree index. So I showed you how we would handle duplicate keys inside of the, the node, right? We could, we could duplicate the values in the node and then, or just have a, of a mapping from a key to a value list inside the node. So now I want to talk about at, at a, uh, what I realized I missed out was discussing at a higher level, actually within the tree itself, how do we can actually maintain these duplicate indexes or duplicate keys? So there's two approaches to do this. So the first is that, uh, we're going to make every key unique automatically by appending the, the corresponding tuple's record ID to the key that we're inserting in, into the index. So instead of just storing the, key, you know, the copy of the attribute that's in, in, the, in the table, I'm also going to prefix, or sorry, put at the end as a suffix, the record ID for that tuple. So now that makes every single key automatically unique. So the reason why we can do this, and this still works, is because we're using a B plus tree. Remember I said it with B plus tree, we can do partial key lookups and, and still find the things that we want. So if I, if I have an, attribute, or an index on attributes A and B, if I want to do a lookup on A, I can still do that without having B. So in our case, in the B plus tree, because we're not going to have the record ID, we can just do the, the regular lookup as we would with a with key, but we just scan along the leaf nodes until we find all the matches for that given key. You can't do this in a hash table, right? For the hash table, you have to have the entire key. So in order for, to, to, to do this approach, you'd have to have the, when you do a lookup, the key you want, and then the record IDs, the, the record IDs they correspond to. But that seems stupid, because if you had the record IDs, why would you use an index to look up the record IDs? Yes? So uh, how will you generate this unique uh, record ID as an uh you are going to use some kind of hash function. So his question is, what, what is, what is this record ID? It's the page ID and offset we talked about in the very beginning, right? That's the unique identifier for every physical location of a tuple. Now it may change and therefore we, we have to deal with that. Uh, and Postgres is, is most famously the one that with this won't work because they can move things around. But 
when we talk about multi-versioning, we'll see different examples of why this works for Postgres. This doesn't work for Postgres, but it works for other systems. But just assume it's a page ID and offset. Or in the case of SQL Server and Oracle, it was like file number, object number, page ID, and offset, like a more complex thing. The other approach is to somewhat violate the sanctity, if you will, of the design of the B plus tree and actually store uh, the duplicate keys as overflow leaf nodes. So instead of expanding the leaf nodes horizontally to accommodate new, new entries, we're actually going to expand them vertically. And then with, within a given leaf node, we'll add these overflow pages, almost like the chain hash table we talked about before, and just add all the duplicate keys down there. So as we'll see in a second, I'll, I'll get, get provide overviews of what this looks like. This approach is going to be more complex because now we have to handle the case of where I'm scanning along my leaf nodes. I have to know how to follow those, uh, you know, follow down the overflow pages. If I'm scanning reverse direction, you know, wh where do I start my scan when I jump back in the other direction? So most people implement this one. Uh, this has the advantage that, again, we don't have to make any major changes to our data structure, whether it's a unique versus non-unique index. Everything just still works the same. The downside is now we're actually storing this record ID as an additional key, you know, element of our key, and that increases the size of our, of our index, the, you know, the, the amount of data it takes to actually store the index. In this case here, we're not storing any redundant information unnecessarily to make things unique, but now we have this management issue. So let's go through both of them. So this is our simple uh, B plus tree that we talked about before. And so the first approach is, again, to append the record ID. So either I'm showing just like the key value, let's assume there's an attribute A, and here's all the values for them. In actuality, what the database system is actually storing is a combination of the key and then that record ID. So now when I do a lookup and say, I want to insert key, key six, I would, at this point here, I can do a uh, prefix search in my, in my B plus tree, because I don't have a record ID as I'm inserting this. Actually, I take it back, you do have a record ID, but I'm not going to find an exact match for that. So I would traverse down here and I would land to this page. Um, the real, I mean, the, the real thing I'm starting is, is the page ID and offset. But I land here, and now I know I want to go in, into this page. So because now I don't have overflow pages, I have to go exactly in sorted order. So assume whatever this original six is, its record ID is less than the one I'm inserting. So it needs to go between the six and seven. So I just do the normal split process that we talked about before. I slide everybody over, seven and eight move here, and now I can, I can update pointers and how six goes in here. Right? It just works exactly the, the same way we talked about before. If I want to do a lookup on six, again, I just do the prefix search. I do the, just look at the first element of the key, just the six, and I can find down here, now I scan along my leaf nodes until I find what I want. The other approach is the overflow pages. So now, again, I want to start six again. I know I want to go into this guy. I can't, I don't want to split across, right? I, want to, I don't want to do what I did before. I have seven, eight move over. I want to go in this page here, but I can't because it's full. So I just add now an overflow page where I insert my new six, and now I have my pointer down to it. Now, remember I said before that, that in, in most textbook definitions of a B plus tree, you assume that the keys are always going to be sorted within the node. In this case here, we could do that, we could sort them, but in the, for the, it's not actually wrong to, to leave it unsorted. We just need to know when we're looking for the element that we're looking for. We can't use binary search to jump around. We have to do the linear search to find that we want. So now let's say I, I want to insert seven. Same thing, seven goes down there. I insert six, same thing, six goes here. It's, it's unordered and that's okay. So now here's what needs to happen. So physically, this is stored across multiple pages. Logically, from the index perspective, this just looks like one giant leaf node that has a bunch of in it. So now if I'm scanning across, I, I do the same thing. I follow this pointer, I land here, and now if I'm scanning across, instead of jumping over to this node, I know I need to follow my overflow page and keep looking there. And eventually, if I find what I'm looking for, I'm done. If not, I need to go to the next page, then I just follow that pointer over there. So now I'm be thinking, well, why not just have this guy, shouldn't this guy really be pointing to that one, right? Because that would actually be correct. But now the problem is every single time I add a new overflow page, not only do I need to update uh, you know, my pointers internally for, for these, two no th these nodes over here, I now need to go update this one as well. But if I just leave that pointer alone and let it point to the beginning of my page, the, you know, the, the, the topmost leaf node in this vertical tower, then I would just land there and say, oh, well, I'm going reverse search. I really need to jump to the end of my overflow page and work backwards. 
There's a bunch of extra logic we have to do to accommodate this. Yes? I haven't reviewed docs, so whenever... Sorry, say it again. What was your first word? Sorry? Sorry? You haven't reviewed what? Sorry? No, I have a trivial doubt, a question. Oh, we have a doubt. Okay, yeah. So it, it's that uh, whenever uh, we get something like uh, fetch six, so what the system actually asks us to fetch all the pages corresponding to the key. So we key, key six. So we need to fetch all these three pages back. So his question is, uh, if someone's, if the data system is using the index, uh -huh. and we're trying to find the tuples that have the, the value six for this particular key. So what is the index returning? Yeah. Well, it would turn the record IDs. So you, you, would, you would say, you basically have an iterator. I traverse down, get to my leaf node, and now I'm looking, calling next, next, next on this iterator, and I'm looking at every single element until I find the ones that I want. And I knew the iterator knows to stop, which says, I'm looking for everything that, where key equals six. So as soon as I see maybe a nine over here, I need to stop. But this is what I'm saying. If you know, if this is unsorted, then I know I need to scan to the end of all my overflow pages because I you know, this, the last six might be here. Yeah. If I want to keep them sorted, then you know now I insert this six here. Now I got to go update this guy and this guy. Whereas before, if I just append it only, it's it, I'm updating one page. So this is a really good example of why you know why trying to understand these data structures in the context of a real a full system is important. If you take an algorithms class, an algorithms class will teach you, yes, this is the way to start a B plus tree. But now, because we're inside of a database system, we know we have these things called record IDs, and we can exploit them to make, to facilitate different aspects or different operations that would not be otherwise easy to do. Yes? Like, um, presumably, if we overflow like, the overflow, we continue to another overflow. Correct. So his statement is, if, if this thing overflows, we just keep continuing. Yes? Then, as, presumably, there's a certain point when you want to actually like, rebalance. Correct. And then he says, to a certain point, you actually want to rebalance. So, Yes, so that could be a criteria that says, all right, well, if I go beyond this number of overflow pages, then do a split. But if these are all sixes, right, in a single page, then you can't, you can't quite, you know, easily do that without appending the record ID. All right, cool. So let's do a demo, because we didn't get to do this last time. So we're going to do Postgres, um, and I just want to show the difference between a, uh, a B plus tree and a hash index. All right, let me turn this off. All right, cool. Let me log in over here. So I'm going to have a table. Is this live? Yeah, OK. So this is Postgres. I'm going to have a table uh, of email addresses. So it's going to be a simple, a simple table with an ID with an auto increment key and then a bunch of email addresses. So this is a file that you can find on the internet. Um, this is a list of 27 million email addresses from If you don't know what that is, it was a, um, a uh, think of like Tinder before Tinder. It was an adult hookup site in Canada that got hacked, and then eventually people released the, uh, the email addresses. So this is real. Um, it shouldn't take that long to load, but uh, I should have done this beforehand, but that's okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create two indexes. We're going to create a hash index. So in Postgres, you can actually say, well, when I want to create an index, I want it to be a hash index. And then you can then say, uh, I want to create an index, and I want it to be a B plus tree index. Of course, yeah. Well, this is that a good demo, right? OK. So maybe we'll come back to this. Let's go to MySQL. Sorry about that. OK. So same thing. This is MySQL. Uh, so I can do select count star from emails. All right, Postgres finished. Actually, let's go back to Postgres, because it's done. All right, it took a minute. So I told you I, I inserted 27 email addresses. So I, first I'm going to do is I'm going to create a hash index. So in, in def by default in SQL, in most systems, if you just create an index, you're going to get a B plus tree, if, you know, or some tree data structure. In Postgres, I can say using hash. So I'm forcing it to use a hash index. And so now we can see things like, of course, now i got to load this. Oh, I should have warmed it, sorry. This shouldn't take too long. Um, but the, the, we can see how if we try to do certain queries, we won't be able to find uh, the things that we want. Let me load all this in. Sorry. PG warm. So this is that same function I used last time, just to warm the cache. And then now when I call create index, 
in theory, this should be faster because everything's just loaded in. Um, but we're going to run queries, and we're going to see how the query planner is not going to be able to pick the index for some queries, but it'd be able to pick indexes for other queries, right? Because a hash index, again, you have to have the entire, uh, the entire key or the entire elements of the key. You can't do partial lookups, and you can't do range scans. Mm, sorry. Well, this sucks. All right, while this is going on too, I'll, I'll then create the, uh, the B plus tree index in the background. I had everything working and then I dropped the table right before class started and I forgot to rebuild it. All right, we're back. Okay, so it took 50 seconds. All right, so now I can do, say, queries like select star. Let's, let's find a user first. Select star from... Let's find the, the, the minimum email address from emails. Oh, yeah, there we go. Whatever that is, someone correctly used a fake email address. So if I want to do select star from emails, where email equals this thing, again, if I add that explain keyword, Postgres will tell me what it's going to do. So Postgres is going to tell me that, hey, I have this thing called a hash index, and, and, I, and I can do, and do a lookup, because I know I can do exactly the thing I'm looking for will e equal that text. Right? We'll ignore what a bit, bitmap scan or heap scan is. That'll come later on. But, in, but we know this is going to be fast, because it's going to go find exactly the, the one that we're looking for. Right? But now, say if I want to do something like where email like, and then this thing, and put a, put a wildcard at the end, can you use this hash index? No, right? Because you have to have the entire key. I'm not going to run it because it'll probably run, take the whole time. But, uh, but they can tell you when, when you're asking explain, it tells you it's going to default to the sequential scan. Remember, the sequential scan is always the default operation or access method for the database system. If it can't find what it wants using index, it always defaults to a sequential scan. So while this is going on, let's, uh, let's build the, the tree index. But we can see some other things too, right? So let's say we want to find, we want to count all the email addresses where the, that are greater than this, right? Can it do that? No, again, right? Because we have to have the partial key. We can't do anything that's not an equality predicate. It always has to be an exact match, right? It can do some things though, right? So let's say we find the, there's, let's say somebody else also did this one too. Is whether that exists. I didn't find that. But actually, that was pretty fast for a sequential scan. No, wait, sorry, that, that's an index scan. So let's find another one. Let's find another one. Let's find the somebody who, somebody who starts with an A. So like A star, and then we'll limit one. And this basically says, just keep, find me the first one that, you, that, that, that matches that. Right, so there's somebody's email address. That, that looks but that's okay. Um, but if we can do other things like this or email equals like that. And it was able actually to do two index scans. So nose has that or clause. And you can see, I'll do one probe in the index, try to find what I want, do another probe in the index and try to find what I want. And then it combines them together. And that's, that's what the bitmap or means. Basically what's happening here is the bitmap index means that it's trying to find all matches and then instead of storing the record ID, it maintains a giant bitmap, and it then just stores the, the you know, it sets that bit of that offset to say that, that record matched. And then it combines them together, and then it produces the output. So that's why it sort of has to do this, and then another lookup over here. All right, so now our B plus tree is done. So now we come back to our original query here. Yes? In last class, didn't you explain that it will do only one search and it will organize the search in a way that both of them are being done together? Your statement is, didn't I say last class that it would do the search once and then organize it? It will go through the B tree down to one. This is a hash index. This is, a B, this is not the, this is the B plus tree. Sorry, this is a hash table. This is not a B plus tree. Okay? Um, like going back to... Well, now, I just added the B plus tree. But yeah, right there. So... This is explain. Explain is telling you what the query plan is going to be. So it tells you, I'm going to do an index scan using IDX emails hash. That's the name of the hash table index I created. Okay? So now my ha my, my, I have my, um, 
I have my, my B plus tree index. So if I do something like this, just do this lookup we had before, this fake email, it tells me it wants you to hash, hash using the hash index. But as soon as I add this, I add the range predicate down here. Is it going to use the hash table? No. It's going to use the, and actually it's going to use control scan. All right, this is another good example. So this guy is the smallest key that we have in our index. So it knows that if I want to use the index, then all I'm really doing is jumping to the, the far left point and just scanning along the leaf nodes. And so therefore the traversal of the index was a waste of time. Therefore, it's better for me to just do a sequential scan. But let's say if I change that to Z, a bunch of Zs, and now it says that, all right, well, I know that if I use my index, I'm going to throw away a lot of data. So now I can use that the tree to jump down to the right side of the tree, get a starting point, and then a scan along the leaf nodes. Right? So there's this internal cost model thing that's going on in Postgres that we'll talk about later that allows it to decide when's the right time to do these things. So is this clear? So for a quality predicate, the hash index is going to be pretty good. But for, the, for these range predicates, uh, if it's at the right location, again, we know something about the distribution of values, then it will choose to do an index leaf scan. So now, if we go back here, again, this guy was doing the, the index scan, doing exact point query lookup. If I drop that index, drop index emails hash, comes back right away, and now I do that predicate. Now it's smart enough to know, oh, I no longer have that hash index, I have, but I do have this tree index, so I can use that for this quality predicate. So is this clear? All right, the other thing we talked about last class briefly was, was table clustering. So table clustering is the, where we're going to use the index to enforce the sort ordering of the, of, of, the, uh, of the table themselves, the tuples themselves. So remember, Postgres is unsorted, or sorry, the relational model is unsorted. So as we insert things into Postgres, it's just putting them in the, essentially the order that it, that, that it was told to put them in like, as we do the inserts. And we saw examples where I could update things, delete things, and I can reshuffle them depending on how I, I you know, what, you know, what free slots are available in a page. So if I go, say, do a select query here, select star from emails, and I just say, just give me the first one. All right, we get some random Gmail account. But now if I say, uh, if I call this clustering command, this will take about a minute. But what this is doing, this, is, this command is forcing Postgres to, to essentially resort the entire uh, table based on the, 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 the sort ordering defined by this index. But this is a one-time operation. So as I, as I modify the table and maybe things get out of order, it's not, you know, it's not going to match what it was when I first set it up here. Some systems, like in MySQL and SQL Server and Oracle, you can say I want an index cluster table or an index table clustering on the index. And therefore, it ensures that no matter how you insert values into your table and what order you insert them, the underlying physical storage will be, will be sorted. So in some cases, this allows to do binary search directly on the table themselves, which is still log in, without having to go through the index itself. So this is going to take a long time, so we'll just let this go. Um, but I quickly want to jump back over to MySQL. So again, same email address loaded into MySQL. I can do the same kind of queries. Select star um, from emails where, where that fake one was. Email equals that. So the, the MySQL explain is, is not as good. Um, but basically, it's not a tree structure. You read it here, it says, this is, here's the index I could possibly use. So it knows I have a hash index, and I can use that. And then if I do change that to be greater than this, still uses it. Ah, no, but it, it says here the, the, it's kind of hard to see, it's small. Um, it's, it's rolled over here, but see the, there's this column here called rows. This is MySQL telling you how many rows it's going to, I think I might have to read. So that's 27 million wrapped around, around here. So it could use this hash index, but it's going to fall back and do a, a simple sequential scan. Whereas the one up above, it could do an index, index probe to find exactly what it wanted. All right. All right, so Postgres is now done. We're coming back here. So now if I do limit one, 
right? I get that first guy that I had before, right? So this is saying, again, give me the very first tuple you find for this, for, for this and this is the min one that we found before, because this guaranteed that this was inserted order. So if I, if I do this now, if I say I delete that email address, delete uh, emails where email equals this thing, I go ask for the first one, and now I get a different fake, fake email address, but now let me insert another one back in, insert into emails, uh, values default, because it's a to auto increment and key, insert my guy back in. Right, it's still not in sorted order. Because it only did that operation once. Any questions? So you have to run cluster again and again to make it sorted. This question is, to enforce sort order, I'd have to run cluster over and over again. For Postgres, yes. For other systems, you do not have to do that. You can say, I want it to be auto automatically clustered by the index. Does the uh, column needs to be indexed before we cluster? This question is, does the column need to be indexed before we cluster? No. So in my SQL, it's sorted by the primary key. Uh, so in my SQL, the leaf nodes are actually the tuples themselves. Yeah. So as I'm moving things around, splitting and merging, the, the leaf nodes will always be in that sort of order. So if I want to do a sequential scan on the table, I, I'm basically always following leaf nodes. And so in other systems like Oracle and SQL Server DB2, you can say, Create this table and sort it by these columns, and it'll do it for you. Oh, sorry. Yes. For duplicate keys, you said that we'll add the page ID and record ID as the suffix, right? Yes. So instead of that, why don't we use the timestamp when the record was inserted? This question is: um, I said that we could use the physical ID, sorry, the physical location, the page ID, and the slot number as the record ID to determine to make the the tuples unique. Instead, why not use the timestamp of when the tuple was inserted? Because the physical location can change, right? Because if it, yeah, so in Postgres, this is an issue. For MySQL, this, this won't be an issue. What's the problem with timestamp? The distributed setting, like time is. He said in distributed setting, the times aren't going to be synchronized. Yes, even more simple. That is an issue. Leap second, leap years, right? So now, again, they, they repeat the second. Now what happens? I insert something, now they have the same timestamp. Or clocks can drift. Like clocks are horribly inaccurate. So you know, it, I, I run NTP every so often, and now it, it slowly drifts the clock, but occasionally it has to do big, big steps. It might repeat a second. Yes? I suppose if you, like, what's the difference just being using like a millisecond like or something like that? It's like his question is, what's the difference between doing the record A versus milliseconds versus the unique sequence? Like, so like if you, yeah, if you do like milliseconds after or something like that, like then you, isn't that going to be unique and take care of the leap second? Because it just takes into account the milliseconds, but that leap second is unique. <laughs> yeah, so he's right. Milliseconds, since the unique sequence clock would take care of the leap year, it won't help drift, right? If the clock has to get stepped back, you repeat seconds. Nobody uses timestamps in that way. You can use logical timestamps which we'll talk about later on, you, you almost, almost never want to use hard physical clocks. You use them in conjunction with other things. Yes? When do you want to use a cluster if you already have an index? The question is, why, when would you want to use a clustering index when, if you already have an index? So again, like in the case of MySQL, I should show, show an example. In MySQL, it's always a clustering index. When I call create table, it's always clustered on that. There are some cases where, uh, for certain queries, it, for certain queries, you can be smart about like, all right, well, if I'm clustering on the on the logical timestamp when it was inserted, like the application told me the timestamp, uh, then now maybe I can say, well, take the last days worth of data and put it on the fast disk, and the older stuff puts on slower disk. There's ways to do like disk partitioning that way. And the, the data system can enforce that all for me underneath the covers. I, I was wondering, like uh, in MySQL, you said that uh, all the things are sorted by the primary key. And uh, yes. say, suppose we have the email and we uh, do index on email. Yes. And we do the cluster on email. Yes. And we try to find something through ID. So wouldn't that be an issue? Because now that everything is sorted based on email. You, so your statement is if if I have if I'm if I'm clustered on email, I have an index on email, yeah. 
and that's my primary key. And then, uh, primary key's ID. So if you have a primary key, we'll see this in a second, you always have an index on that, on that, on that, uh, on, on that ID or on the attributes. You cluster the locations things, right? Yeah, so then you have to update the index, yes. Depends how you store your indexes. We'll get to that later. Like, in a, we'll get that when you talk about the version. So you, the, the pointer could be the primary key or it could be the record location, the record ID. Okay. You can do different things. Postgres does record ID, so we have to update all the time. MySQL does primary key. All right, so we actually can poke around in Postgres real quickly and see what the uh, see what the, the you know what, roughly what the tree looks like, right? So this is just a, an extension of Postgres that allows you to get information about uh, what's in the tree, right? So I can say I have this index called you know on the, on B plus tree, and I can say you know give me information about it. it. Tells you how many levels it has, tells you how many elements that it's storing, and the root block size. So then we can go even further and we can actually get inspect the contents of the tree uh, with this command here. And you know, the, the actual details doesn't matter, but there's a bunch of hex stuff. Right? So this is the root node. So we can go, go a bit deeper now and show you, you know, for a single node, here's some information about it. But then we, that's all hex, but we can decode it. And then here's, here, you know, here's just proving that it's actually storing these emails. So this is saying that here's a record at offset three in my root node, uh, or in this particular node in the tree, here's the you know page number and offset where it's located. Here's the hex form form of what's being stored, and then there's the actual email address. Right. So again, the the data system is going to store entire copies of these keys on, on the inside. All right, we're going to stop now and keep going because we have a bunch of other stuff we want to get through. Um, but that's just again to show you that you can, by default, you're always going to get a uh, uh, B plus tree, but you can force some systems to tell you I want a hash index, and there's different trade-offs for doing this. All right, so now related to the point he said about the the primary key, uh, you know, and the, versus the cluster index. So if you create a primary key, the database system will automatically create an index for you. And actually, for any time you you declare a an integrity constraint, it will automatically create an index for you. And you think about it, it has to, because otherwise, the only way to enforce that is to do a sequential scan. So in my one, my auto increment key, if I had to enforce the primary key uniqueness of it, every single time I inserted that you know, unique, unique tuple, if I didn't have an index, I had to scan every single tuple all over just to make sure there's nobody has the same, same key. So again, every data system will do this automatically for primary key and unique constraints. It, and right, so basically, again, when I create the table, if I have primary key and unique, it, it's the same thing as running these commands. I'll create the table, then it goes ahead and creates these indexes. For foreign keys, it doesn't actually do this. So if I create a new table here uh, called bar and has a foreign key reference to this value here, every database system that I ever try this on will always throw an error because it's saying I, I, it doesn't have a way to, in, to enforce this referential integrity constraint without an index. Right? You think it could automatically create one, but it doesn't do that because it doesn't know, because this has to be unique. Right? So it won't actually do this. Instead, you just replace that with, you know, add the unique clause here, and that, that, that builds an index automatically for you that it can then use to enforce this. Because right? think what, basically what the way foreign keys work is that every single time I insert a new tuple into bar, I have to have this ID thing. So then to make sure that it matches to a tuple in my, this table, I then do a lookup in that index and see whether I, uh, there, there is a you know, parent referential match. So now I want to talk about different ways to actually use indexes beyond the you know, copy the whole key that we talked about here today. So the first thing that we can do is what's called a partial index. So when you normally call create index on a table, it does a sequential scan across the entire table and looks at every single tuple. But in many cases, uh, for a lot of applications, maybe you don't need to have an index on the entire table. And instead, you always want to maybe on the, you know, some subset of the data. So this is what a partial index is. You basically modify the create index command, and you add this where clause at the end that tells you what tuple should match to be, to be, in order to be put into this index. So now, if I want to do a lookup like this, select B from foo, where A equals 1, 2, 3, and C equals Wu-Tang. So, I've built the index on A and B, 
my where clause has re references A, so I can still use this index, but I can also look at this thing and say, oh, where well, C equals Wu-Tang, then I know this is exactly the index I want to use. So then this allows me to do a more, uh, the index is leaner because I'm not storing all the information for all possible tuples. I'm only storing exactly whatever it matches in my where clause. So if some other query doesn't have the C equals Wu-Tang, I can't use that index. So this is very common when people do things like they want to separate, have different indexes for different date ranges. Like, you know, per month I'll have an index so I can do look up quickly on all the orders I want for that, you know, for that month. And again, I'm trying to not have to pollute my buffer pool cache with a bunch of data that I don't need. By having a partial index, now the height's going to be lower and I can quickly find the data that I'm looking for. So in this particular example here, uh, for this query, we were doing a lookup on A using C, and we want to return B. It turns out, actually, for this particular query, all the data we need is in the index itself. So remember I said, normally the index would, would for a given key, would have produce a record ID that you could then follow that to, in the table heap and get the tuple that you, you were looking for. But for this particular query here, we don't actually even need to even look at the tuple. Because we need A to do the lookup, that's in there. We need B, that's in there. And C is already handled by the partial index where clause. So to answer this query, we only need to actually look at the index. We never actually need to look at the underlying tuple in the table. So this is what is called a covering index. A covering index means that the, all the fields that are necessary to answer the, the required result for the query are produced, you know, are, 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 can be found in the index itself. Right, so you don't declare an index as a covering index. This is something the database system figures out for you automatically. I know, knows what your query is, it knows what your index, it says everything I need is in here. So again, just using this example, simple example, I can get the B field from that, from that, the A and B field can be found exactly from this the index, and I never need to look at the, the actual tuple. And I can do this for, for a bunch of different queries. I can do this for aggregations, I can do this for joins. And the advantage here is one less, you know, page ID look up in the page table and maybe one less disk IO to not have to go look at the underlying tuple for this. So the, a bunch of different data systems support this. Uh, all the commercial guys do, Mongo does. I don't think MySQL and Postgres do. I may be wrong about that. Um, but this is a big win, right? If you can do this, this, this is a huge deal. Actually, I, I don't think Postgres can do this um, for reasons we'll talk about later. So. For this simple example, this is great, right? I, have B, I need A and B, A and B can be found in the index. But what if I have now another, uh, I have another attribute that I want to be able to do a lookup on or get for my query, but I don't actually want to build the index on that attribute, right? So my table has column A, B, and C. Maybe I don't want to index on C, but it'd still be nice to have a covering index and not, not have to go look at the tuple. So this is what the include columns allows you to do. Basically, an include column allows you to say, for all the keys that I'm storing in my, for my, my leaf pages, my leaf nodes, also include these additional attributes. So in this case, I'm building index on A and B. All the inner nodes only have keys A and B. And when I do lookups, I only examine A and B. But when I land into the leaf nodes, I can also get the C attribute value for every single entry in there. Right? So now, again, if I go back to my other query here, select B from Foo, where A equals 1, 2, 3, and C equals Wu-Tang. I do my lookup on A, follow that down. Then as I'm scanning along the leaf nodes, uh, I can look at the values at C that's packed in the leaf nodes and also uh, value my predicate and produce my output. So this one is also, this one's more rare than the covering index support. So a lot of systems support the partial indexes. F f slightly fewer systems support the covering indexes. This one is, is even more rare. I think this is Postgres 11 has, sorry, yeah, Postgres 11 is going to add this or has, has it now. SQL Server has it, but MySQL doesn't support this and uh, Oracle does not support this. So again, the key thing about this is that although we can do a lookup and see in, uh, in, in our where clause, it's not in the internet. So the, we're not you know, greatly increasing the size of the overall uh, index. The last kind of uh, index I want to talk about are functional expression indexes. So again, everything we've shown so far, anytime we, we declare an index, we're always creating an exact copy of the key that's in the tuple and putting that in our index. But there may be some kind of que some queries out there where 
we don't actually want to do a lookup on the exact value of a key. We want to do a lookup on some value that we derive from the key. So let's say I have a simple example here. I have this users table and I want to do a lookup and find all the users that logged in on a Tuesday. So this extract function just takes a timestamp and you pass in what element of the, of the date or timestamp you want. So DOW means day of week. And so this is saying extract the day of week from the login timestamp field and find the ones where it equals two. Tuesday is two. Sunday is zero, Monday one, Tuesday two. So if I create an index like this, as we've shown so far, right, this won't work. Why? Yes? Do you happen to know which uh, dates will hash, will, which dates in whatever store format you're storing will actually have? Correct. So he, this one says, he says, you have to know how to extract out or, or pull out exactly what ranges uh, will correspond to Tuesday. And so you can kind of be smart and say, oh, well, my query looks like this. I could say, well, here's the, here's the ranges of timestamps where Tuesday can be found. But as far as I know, no system actually does this. So instead, we, what you can just do is not use this and create a functional index or expression index where the actual the, 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 the attributes you're, you're indexing on can be any arbitrary expression. Anything you can have in a where clause, you can, you can build an index on. All right? So now when I want to do a lookup and, uh, for, this, for this predicate, I know how to exactly satisfy it by you know, you know, doing, looking at every feed, uh, just scanning along here, finding all the, 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 the twos that match what we, what we want. What's another way we, we, could, we could speed this query up too that we've already shown before? The partial index way, right? So in, instead of creating an index for exactly, uh, in this way, for exactly for the extracted day a week, I can instead just use that as my, my where clause to say put only the elements where, uh, where the extract value produces two. All right, so let's do a demo of this in Postgres. So Postgres has the partial indexes, it has the, uh, doesn't have covering indexes, and then the version I have here is 10, so it doesn't have the include clauses. But we can play around partial indexes versus the functional indexes. All right, so for this, we're going to create a table. Um, make sure we turn off parallel workers. And timing is on. All right, so we're going to create a table that has, uh, again, ID field and a login timestamp. And then this is going to be a simple... Uh, this insert query is just going to insert uh, a bunch of records, uh, a bunch of unique timestamps since 2015 to now at, at one minute intervals, right? And this is going to generate, uh, looks like, two, two billion records. So in sake of time, we'll, we'll go make this go fast, so we'll PG warm everything. Now everything's in our buffer pool. So say this is the query we want to run. We want to get the average ID of users where the, uh, the day a week is, they logged in on a Tuesday, right? So in this case here, when we, when we want to explain, right, it has to do a sequential scan, right? There's no index. So the first index we can build is the expression index. And this shouldn't take long. So now we, when we run explain, we can see that it's able to pick out and use that expression index we just built. Right? And again, the way, the way it did that, it said, oh, I know you're trying to do a lookup on this particular, you know, extract function where and where the output is two. So now I just need to do a lookup and say, find me all the, the, the values where it equals two. So then we can add the partial index. Again, this is now creating a smaller index that only contains the, uh, enter, or did I? It only contains the, the records where that extract function equals two. So now if I go back to my function here, and I see now it actually wants to pick that index because that's going to be a, it's going to be smaller, less, it's a, the tree is, 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 has a lower height, and I can just find exactly what I want immediately. So again, the database system can figure out on its own which is the best access method to use for all these different choices. All right, so any questions about this? Yes? If my expression index is something like difference of the day from the current day, 
and now the date changes, then won't it lead to problems? Okay, so he said, so let's try it out, right? So drop index. So his statement is, what happens if my expression is a uh, it's based on some some difference, or so, b b using the current timestamp? Isn't that going to change every single time I run it? So I think what Postgres is going to do. So let's you, let's, let's do the. Uh, yeah, let's do the expression index. Where is that? Yeah. So he's saying do this. Take login. And again, I can put anything I want in here, as long as, long as it's a valid expression. So I can say, take my login and subtract out now, the current timestamp. Doesn't let you do that. I forgot how to do this in... Yeah, I forget, there's, I forget how to do subtraction in um, Postgres. Can you do that? That works. Okay. Oh, cause I, yeah, because you have to do this. Okay. Nope. Nope. Let's just do let's do let's do something more simple. Let's take a login, subtract a hundred from it. Didn't like that either. Yeah, all right, so basically what happens when we call create index, it'll run the now function once, and whatever that timestamp is now, that's now now. Later on, it doesn't change. It's not dynamic. It's, it's as it builds the index. So now if I insert something again, uh, in theory, it should now use that the correct current now. If it's smart, it could say, well, what was the now at the time when I built the index? I don't know whether it does that or not. But again, so you can't do certain stupid things like you can't do like one, build an index on one, but I should be able to do uh, ID plus one. No. Wait, what am, I, what am I missing here? It's, oh, I think it's this. There we go, that's what it was. Right, it's double parentheses. So yeah, so now I can't, it won't let me do this. Without, no, I already, User, login, expr. Let's try his other example. Functions in the index expression must be marked immutable. So there you go. Yeah. But I should be able to do this, right? Like. Nope, no time's out. All right. Anyway. You get my point. Yeah. There's this thing called, we'll talk about snapshots later on, but like, there's like the now at the time the query runs, and it has to be guaranteed that's consistent at the, 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 for the snapshot of the index itself. Yes? Uh, some concept confusion. I mean, when we create index, which kind of index do we create? Like, I mean, pathway or a. So this question is when we create an index, what kind of index is it going to create? So, I, so by default, it's going to create a B plus tree. If I add that using clause from before, so th th but this, this is a Postgres idiom. This is not in the SQL standard. So I, if I add this using hash, this tells Postgres, make me a hash index. By default, everyone's usually going to get a B plus tree. And when we add index, I mean, uh, we can boost performance. But the reason is you don't need to search this tuple. Your question is, when, when you add an index, you can yeah, make, make, make the performance better, right? Yes. But the reason is, I, I mean, the, I won't ask the reason. The reason is the search faster, or the reason is we don't need to look at the list node anymore because we have all the information in the, in the, in the index. Uh, sorry, so, so when you say you don't, you don't need to look at the leaf nodes, of what? The index? Uh, the information. Like we select something. Uh, so I think your question is, if, if I have an index, and if I do a lookup, for some queries, I don't have to look at the actual tuples. I get to look at the indexes. Yeah. So you recall, like, the tuples are you know, in the table heap. 
don't, they're not leaf nodes. The leaf nodes are in the, in the index, right? So I always, I always have to look at the index because I, in a B plus tree, I always have to go to the bottom, okay? So you, for some queries, if you can do a covering index lookup, I never have to look at the table, the tuple. I can get all the information I need to compute the answer from the index itself. Not all database systems support that, though. For, so for what we've talked about so far, other than covering indexes, the idea is that we can quickly find the, the tuples that have the keys that we want to look up on without having to do a sequential scan. So, so sequential scan is n. If it's, a, if it's a hash index, I can do a 1. If it's a B plus tree, it's log n. Right, so the idea is, is cutting down as much data as you can to, to not look at, not do wasted work. Yeah, so we create the table, inert some data, so we no index, then we have to do the differential. Correct, the statement is, if we create a table and there's no index, we always have to do a sequential scan. Yes, we saw that at the very beginning. Yeah. Yes? And uh, if you create an index, uh, does it create the entire data structure uh, in the memory? The question is, if I create an index, where does it live? Well, again, if it's backed by disk, it goes, you know, it gets written out, the, you know, if it's backed by the buffer pool, it goes out the disk. And I want to do that because my index might be larger than the amount of memory that's available to me. So again, I could have, I could have an ephemeral data structure that's in memory, and I have to blow that away. My SQL does that for, for their hash table, because it has to be in memory. But the B plus tree is backed by disk, so as it gets too large, I page things out. Okay, so we'll, we'll have the, like, uh, we have our, uh, Table separate and index separate. So that what do you mean by separate? Separate in memory? Separate memory? It, it could be the same buffer pool. It could be different buffer pool instances. It depends on the implementation. Again, the buffer pool manager doesn't know what's inside the pages. It just says, you want page one, two, three? Here it is. And then whoever is, is, is accessing it is responsible to know how to interpret those bytes. The buffer pool manager doesn't know, doesn't care. In the high-end systems, you can say, here's the buffer pool manager for indexes, and it has certain replacement policies, and here's one for tables, and they have another replacement policy. But for Postgres and MySQL, it's all the same. Okay. So, um, let's now jump back and finish up with tries. Okay. So, in all the examples I showed for the B plus tree so far, the, the inner nodes and the leaf nodes always had an exact copy of the keys. Yes, you can do prefix compression or suffix truncation, as we talked about last time, but in general, we have the entire copy of the key replicated multiple times th throughout, throughout the, the tree structure. And so the other issue is going to be also in a B plus tree is that in order for me to determine whether a key exists in my table, I always have to get to the leaf node. I always have to traverse all the way to the bottom. Right? Because again, the, the inner nodes may have copies of keys that don't no longer exist. Because when I delete them from the leaf node, depending on how I split and merge, I may have left my guideposts up above. So in order to determine whether I know exactly this key exists, I always have to go to the leaf node. So this, you know, again, it's log n instead of instead of O n. To have to do a sequential scan, but it's still not great. And I may have, if, you know, depending on how much memory I have and how I'm using my, my buffer pool manager, I may have a page miss where I have to do a lookup on disk for every single node as I traverse down. So for some applications, it, would, it might be nice if we can actually figure out at the top of the tree whether our key exists without having to go all the way to the bottom. So this is what a try does for us. So quick show of hands. Who here has heard of a try before? Okay, perfect. Who here has heard of radix tree? Fewer. Excellent. Okay. So, so radix tree is just a, a specialization of a try. And nobody uses tries. Everyone uses radix trees in databases. So we'll, we'll go through this. So a try is a tree data structure where instead of storing the entire copies of keys in our nodes in, in the tree, we're instead going to store digits of the key. And by digits, I don't necessarily mean Arabic numerals. I mean some, some subset atomic subset of, of our key, like a byte some, or some, a, a single bit. And so what happens is that we're, we're basically going to decompose all our keys and store them down, uh, the digits down you know, <coughs> at different levels, one by one. And then now because we could have duplicated keys or duplicated digits, we only need to store that once at each level. 
So a, a really simple example here would be a try like this, where I have three keys, hello, hat, and have. So in the first level in the root node, all three keys begin with the letter H, so I sort H once. And there's a path down to the second level, where now I, I see I distinguish between hello and hat and have. Hello has an E, hat and have have an A for the second digit. So I have separate entries for that, and then now I have separate paths down to handle for you know, each, each unique path in the key. So now if I want to do a lookup, say I want to look up a hello, I just decompose it, the key into its digits, and I look at the H, I have a match here, I find the E, and then I traverse down the L O O. And the bottom is just like our uh, in our B plus tree, this could be a record ID that points to the actual tuple that we're looking for. So tries are old. Tries are older than B plus trees. Remember, B plus trees were invented in like 1973 at IBM. Tries were actually from, invented in like 1959 by this French dude. Um, and it, he didn't have a name for it. And then there was this another CS researcher, the famous guy, Edward Fenkin. And then a year or two later, he proposed the name try, uh, which is short for retrieval tree. And he, he was using that to distinguish from, from a regular tree data structure. So this is why they're called tries. And apparently this Edward Fenkin guy is actually CMU faculty. If you go look at the, you know, the, the CS website, the directory, he's listed there. He's like super old. I've never seen him at any faculty meeting. I don't know who he is. I don't know if he's actually still here, but that's the guy that invented the term try. He's actually here at CMU, supposedly. So sometimes you also see these things listed as digital search trees or prefix trees. As far as I know, these are all, these are all the same thing. So tries are really interesting, right, in the context of databases, right? Especially if, you know, now, now that we understand B plus trees. So the first thing that's super interesting about them is that their shape only depends on the, the key distribution of the key spaces and their length. So what I mean by that is that it's a deterministic data structure. So no matter what order we insert the keys, we're always going to end up with the same shape of the physical data structure. Right? That's not the same thing as in a B plus tree, because in a B plus tree, if I insert a keys one way, and then I shuffle them around, and then and I insert them to another tree, depending on how I do it splits and merges, I may end up with different layouts of the nodes. The keys might be in one node versus another node. In a try, it's always, it's always the same thing. Right? The other thing about them is that they don't actually require any, any rebalancing like we had in the B plus tree. So we'll see, you know, there is some rebalancing we could do at the, at the vertical level, but horizontally, we're never actually going to potentially re rebalance. So, and unlike in a B plus tree, where all the operations were log n, in a try, the operation complexity is k, where k is the length of the key. Right? This is totally different than, than a B plus tree. So going back here, so if I want to look up hello, I... By the time I get here, I know that there's no, you know, I keep going down the bottom, but so the number of steps I have to do is dependent on the key that I'm looking up. But say I'm going to look up Andy, A-N-D-Y, the first letter is A, I look up in the root node, I see it only has an H, I immediately stop and I know the thing I'm looking for can't be anywhere else in the tree, and I don't have to always traverse the bottom. Yes? For the E, don't you have to iterate across that entire block? Your question is, for the E here, do I have to iterate across the entire block? You know, like a bazillion, like it's not letters, but it's like, some, some not like really large thing, like you have, to, you have a bazillion, like a really wide block there, you have to figure out which one you want to go down. So the statement is, if this thing is super wide, uh, does, that, does that mean I have to sequentially scan across the entire thing? You pre-sort them. Okay. Right? So you, just, you do binary search to find the thing you're looking for. Well, when we see actually how we actually do this in like, uh, for like bytes, you, you can just jump exactly to the position you want. And it's either there or not there. Yeah, this is not really a you know, physical diagram of how it's actually stored. This is just a high-level overview. Okay. So again, this is super interesting. Because that, the fact that like, the, 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 the complexity is based on the key that we're trying to look up on the length. Um, it's also interesting because now the, the, we're not storing the exact copy of the key you know, directly in any single node. It's implicitly stored by the path. So if we, if we want to reconstruct hello, we would traverse down, keep track of our path on the stack, and that, that's how we can put the key back together. Whereas now this makes sequential scans more difficult because although I can be in sorted order, I gotta backtrack and you know, go back up and go back down, unlike in the B plus tree where I can just scan along the leaf nodes. So tries are gonna be faster for point queries than a B plus tree, but they're gonna be slower than for, for scans. All right, so now we get a bit more formal, talk about uh, the definition of a try. So, but we would use the term uh, span to, to, the same way in a B plus tree. 
for of a node, just to say the span is the number of sort of outgoing branches. This is essentially the number of digits we're going to represent in uh, in in you know, at each node in each level. So if a digit is going to exist in the corpus, then at, at the level at each digit, we'd have to have a pointer now to another branch. If it doesn't exist in our corpus at a level, then we just store null, like a, like a null bit or something. So now this this span is going to use to determine the fan out, just like again in a B plus tree, and that's going to then correspond to the physical height of the, of the try. So the, the parlance you would say I have an n way try, you would say you have a fan out of order n. Again, it's the number pass coming out, and that's going to determine the size of the of the, the digit you're storing at each level. So the most simple try you can store is a one bit try, right? So to each level. I'm going to discriminate the, the, a digit for, of a single bit. So let's say I want to store these three keys, 10, 25, and 31. So it's a one-bit try. So I mean, at each, each level, we're going, to, we're going to look at one bit. So I'm showing them in, you know, here's the binary form of, of these two numbers, or these three numbers. Again, normally these would be 32-bit or 64-bit, but for simplicity reasons, I'm showing them in, in 16 bits. So at the, the try will look like this, and I'll go through... Uh, at each level. So at the root node, we're going to examine the first digit position, the first bit. And again, it's, 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 a, it's one way, it's one bit, so it's either 0 or 1. So in this first position, all three keys have the, have the bit set to 0. So at bit 0, I have a path going down. At bit 1, it's null, because there's no key that matches that. Then I go now down to the second level, and for simplicity reasons, uh, we're just going to repeat this. Think of this repeating across 10 times, right? But it's going to be the same thing. I have a zero. All my, all my tuples or keys ha have a zero at, at every single position and I have a path going down, and one doesn't have anything. But now when I get to this position here, now I see that there, there's a difference. So for key 10, it's bit at, this dig or at this position is zero, so there's a path going down to this side. For the other two, it's, a, it's one, so there's a path going down here. So now if I look at, say, the remaining part of this key, again, it's a single path going down, and it's, you know, it's 1, 0, 1, 0, and same thing. If it's null, I have, there's, there's no, the bit is not set at that position, it's, it's null, otherwise it's, it's a path going down. And then the leaf node, again, this is just a record ID that points to uh, the corresponding tuple. Same thing for the other side, right? At this point here, they're the same, but then they split here, and then now I have separate paths for the other parts. Right, is this so, what, you know, you know, so we can do this in 1 bit, 2 bits, 8 bits, 16 bits. We can do this at, at different levels, different granularities. So what's one simple optimization we can do for this? There's actually two optimizations. How can we reduce the size of this try? Yes? So we definitely don't need to use space to mark those zeros and ones. Exactly. So he says we don't need spaces to mark zeros and ones because... What is this saying, right? So again, this is, this is the value of this, the digit in this position, and then here's the pointer for it. So this is redundant. So all I really need to do is just store the pointers, right? Because if, it's, if, it, at, if the bit is set to 0, I want offset 0. If the bit is set to 1, I go to offset 1. So this is horizontal compression. This is reducing the, 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 the size of, of the tri, each try node. What's another compression way, way I could compress this in the back? He says repeating the number zero ten times. For this one, you actually have to have. So once I get down here, these parts here, there's no other key that matches this. It's sort of what he was saying, but 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 up here, the reason why we had to keep this is because we're going to split here, so we need to know how we got down to here. So but after this, we don't need to store anything. We instead can just store, well, if you go down here at this position, at this level, if the bit is zero. I only have one key that matches, so let me just store the tuple pointer to, to that key. And then same thing over here. So this is vertical compression. Yes? Do you have to store it in order? Can't you just like say, like put in each level like a little like, markation as to what digit of the thing you're searching for it is, and just check that so you don't have to go in order so you can have more balance? So your question is, instead of storing, sorry, say it again, instead of storing the what, sorry? So like, you know, we, like the first, the top, the top node, right? Yes. The zero. Bit, bit, yes. The first bit. So can't you just like put like a little number in each level that says like which bit you are, and you can go in a different order. 
instead of just going iterating from like left to right to go from like second and fifth or something like that. Uh, so this is like a low-level micro optimization. There's like CPU instructions to, to, that you can run in a single instruction for like a for like a, a bit bitmap, a bit sequence. Find me the find me the the value at this offset in a single instruction. So you don't have to iterate. Okay. Or like you find me count me the number of ones in my in, in this bit bit field, right? There's CPU instructions to make this go really fast. So it's not like you're just doing like an, in a for loop sequentially scanning over this. It's not as bad as you think it is. Okay, so again, this is like low-level bit information, but it's this, this showing you at the extreme case, you wouldn't actually want to use a, a you know one one bit or try. Usually, you want to store them as as eight bits or, or a single byte. Um, but it, to me, this is the easiest way to understand this. And so, even now, if it's eight bits, same thing for every single position, I just have a pointer or not, and I can quickly jump to the one you know the offset that I want. So this is fine and dandy if everything's static, but actually, how do we? Uh, how do we modify this thing? We do inserts and updates and deletes. So there is no standard way to maintain a try in the way that there was for a B plus tree. Different implementations do different things. So I'm going to show you sort of one brief example. I'm not saying this is the only way to do this, but there's some of the things you have to be mindful uh, if you're actually trying to build one. So let's say again, this is the hello hat and have key set we had before. So I insert here. Again, I traverse down. I would find this slot here, and now I can insert this into this. Right? So now let's say I want to delete hat. Well, that's here. I go ahead and delete that. And rather than reshuffling everything, maybe it's okay for me to leave uh, an empty space here, right? Because then I don't do any compaction. But now let's say I delete have, and now I, I remove this, and I say, well, now I have this, this node here by itself. And so if I want to you know, actually find hair, I'd have to you know, do an extra hop to go down to the IR, but I know I'm not going to have any other match. So you could decide just to roll everything up and put it up here. Different, again, different implementations do different things. Uh, if you take the advanced class, we'll cover up a bunch of these things. Yes? So once we do the uh, compressions to the try, we get radix tree? Like that? Yeah, so, yeah, let me be real clear. The, a radix tree is one that's vertically compressed. Uh, yeah, I should, I should have labeled that more carefully. Um, yeah, sorry. I, do, I don't have the slide. Yeah, radix tree is, is a is one where you remove remove all the paths. Yeah, I apologize. I, I, I don't know what I don't know. What, it used to be a slide here to define what a radix tree. I don't know what happened to it. Sorry. Um, oh no, this is it. Sorry, this is the radix tree. Sorry, uh, it's when you do the vertical compression uh, to remove any any nodes where there's no other distinct uh, differentiating path below it. Sometimes it's called a Patricia tree, but usually they're called radix trees. And again, it's a subset of a try. Okay, so we covered modifications, and then the last thing I want to briefly talk about uh, is actually how we do comparisons. Actually, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. Let's. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is inverted inver indexes. Again, tries are super interesting. No commercial data system, as far as I know, uh, supports them out of the box. Hyper is a system out of. Um, uh, of, of from Germany that Tableau bought that runs in you know Tableau's it's Postgres compatible. Uh, they they're all in on try. We've done some research here on tries. They're super interesting. But right now the B plus tree is still the dominant data structure everyone uses. But there's a lot of interest in them. All right. So so real quickly, everything that we talked about so far have for these indexes have been satisfying or handling index or point queries and range queries. So if I want to find you know, a record where it's people that live in zip code 15217, right, that's an equality predicate to find exactly the thing I'm looking for. Or if I'm trying to find things within date ranges, right, that's a range scan. Again, I can use, use a B plus tree for that. Where the B plus tree and the hash index hash tables are not good for is when we want to do keyword searches. So for example, say I have the, the entire corpus of Wikipedia. I'm going to find all the Wikipedia articles that, that contain the keyword Pablo. I can't use a hash table index for that, and I can't use a B plus tree index for that, because I'm trying to find a sub-element of, of a value for an attribute. Right? And again, for the B plus tree, and I have to have the exact key. I can't do a partial key. You know, I can do a partial key lookup if the, if the key is comprised of multiple attributes, but within single attribute, I have to have the entire value of it. I can't have like the first 16 bits. 
So this is the problem we're trying to solve here. So quickly, just again, just remind everyone what Wikipedia looks like. The main thing we care about is that there's this revisions table that has a has a tech that's my bookie, sorry, uh, that has the text field. All right, and we want to, we want to be able to find all the matches for Pablo for this. So if I try to create an index on the content field, this is going to be a really bad idea because again, it's going to take the entire key or the entire contents of, of this this attribute in our table and try to build a B plus tree on that. Right? In the case of Wikipedia, this would be really stupid because some articles can be kilobytes. And now I, I'm storing the entire key in, in, my, in, in my index. And I, the only thing I can do look, lookups on is you know, if someone gives me the entire article back, which is stupid. Right? And so in order to do this kind of lookup like this, I, I, I want to do a, instead of you know, something equals something, I want to do a keyword search, like with a like clause, with wildcards, and say, find me all the matches where the, you know, the keyword Pablo is inside of it. Actually, and this is actually not in the right SQL we want either way, because this is going to match for things that have Pablo as a prefix, like Pavlov, like the, the famous Russian scientist. And I'm going to find exactly where my name is being used. So this predicate itself is not going to be useful for us. So this is what an inverted index does for us. So an inverted index is going to map words, I mean, words as we describe them in, in the you know, English language or in, in natural languages, not like uh, byte sequences in, in the processor. So it's going to map words to the records that contain them. And then it's going to allow us to then do lookups on this index and say, find me all the records that contain this keyword or have this you know, keyword with a certain property. So these are sometimes called full text search indexes. And just like with uh, when I created the index and I told Postgres I wanted this thing to be a hash table index, you can do the same thing in some databases. You can say, I'm going to create an index and I want it to be I want it to be an inverted index or a full text uh, search index. So sometimes in, in the theoretical literature, these are called cordances. And this is because there was this old lady in the 1800s who sat down for 16 years and built an inverted index that mapped uh, every single word used by Shakespeare in his, his entire body of work. Right? But this is, nobody calls them this. Everyone instead calls them for, for, uh, full text search indexes or inverted indexes. So all the major database systems will support some variant of this internally. As I said, when you call create index, you can say, I want to have a full text search, in, search index. And they all vary in the sophistication of the, of the indexes and uh, what kind of queries you can run on them. There's all so a bunch of specialized database systems that are, that are sold or marketed as full text search databases. So the most famous one is probably Elasticsearch. And this is built on top of Lucene. Lucene is like a library written by the guy that invented Hadoop. That does like a you know does the search and does it does the indexing, and then Elasticsearch provides like a like a s server interface to to that index. Solar also uses Lucene. I think Sphinx does as well. I use Zeshbian, uh, which is like a standalone C library that does full text search indexing because this is better than the MySQL full text search indexing. But ideally, you know these are all these would be internal or sorry external to like Postgres and MySQL. Uh, whereas these other guys are sort of like it's built inside of it, the system itself. So the we're not going to have time to discuss implementations, but basically the, all the hash table index stuff we talked about so far in the B plus trees, that's what you're going to use to build one of these full text search indexes. So the thing that does a lookup and find me all the you know the, the records that have contained this word, I could build that as a hash table. I could build that as a uh, as, as a B plus tree. But I'm going to augment it with additional metadata that provide the context about how that word was being used in, in, the, in the tuple. So the kind of queries you can do that you can't do on a B plus tree in a full text, full or, or inverted index, uh, you can do phrase searches. So I can do, again, find all the records that contain the word Pablo. Uh, I can do proximity searches. So find me all the records where the, the word Pablo is in, you know, within five words or three words from you know, criminal or alcoholic or something like that, right? Because I'm maintaining the context information about how that word was being used. Then I can also do wild cause searches. That's it's more complicated than the, the like stuff. I can do regular expressions or complex pattern matching to find things I'm looking for. So the things we do care about slightly is that how we're actually going to build this thing. And again, the different systems will all do different things. The thing they're going to vary the most on is what they're actually storing. Again, this is the context information about how the word was found in the in the attribute. So at the very simplest form, you just have you know the word itself and then map to a record ID. But I can also include you know what other words are around it, how many steps away from other words, 
and that will determine how, how complex queries I, I can support on this. The other tricky thing is actually when do you update these things. So if it's built inside of the system, you could, in theory, on every update, make sure you update your, your search index or inverted index. If it's, if it's external, then you have to run this as a cron job or push updates to it. Um, a lot of times, people will stage updates in batches and then apply them every so often because potentially updating the inverted index is super expensive. And again, I realize I'm going this over this super fast. I just want you to be aware that beyond B plus trees and hash tables that we talked about here, there's a whole bunch of other database indexes that are available that can do things beyond point queries and range queries that, that we've looked at. And actually, the, the other class of indexes that we didn't talk about are the geospatial tree indexes. So things like R trees, quad trees, uh, KD trees. These allows you to do multiple dimensional lookups, like in your geometric spaces and things like that. Um, these are very common now in like video databases and image databases. So there's a whole class that Christos Faludos, the other database professor, teaches, 15826. He teaches it in the fall and spring now. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, he'll be teaching it in the spring. So the main takeaway for all of this is that the for our most of the time, the B plus tree is going to what we want. That's the go-to index that's that's very that's resilient and solves many of the problems that people have in databases. Inverted indexes, we can go. If you want to go more detailed? There's a whole other class in I think in uh, LTI uh, 442 or 642. I think it's called search engines, right? But in a search engine, underneath the covers is basically an inverted index. So it's the same the same technology, the same methods. Okay. All right. So next Wednesday, we're now going to go look at how we actually make our B plus tree thread safe. So we've sort of washed all over this, or we've not talked about it, avoid the problem of how, should we, how do we allow multiple threads to update the index at the same time. So now we're going to spend more time talking, talking about that. OK? Any questions? Oh dear, coming through with my shell and poo. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry I with St. Ives in my system, crack another, I'm blessed, let's go get the next one and get over, the object is to stay sober, lay on the sofa, better yet, down Who my sofa. Who be the be stressed out, could never be son, Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one, naturally blessed, yes, my rap is like a laser beam, the boys in the bushes, St. Ives, St. Ives, St. Ives, St. Ives, crack the bottle of the St. Ives, sip it through those who don't realize, the drinking ain't only to be drunk, you can't drive, keep my people still alive, and if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.